back to this lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the topic of free will. In our last video, we talked a little bit about some preliminary points related to free will. For instance, what does it mean to have free will, and also some of the important implications this topic has. Specifically, we talked about the way in which free will seems connected to moral responsibility. If we're not ultimately in control of our actions, if our actions aren't up to us, then for instance it seems weird to say that someone is responsible for doing something wrong, that they're blameworthy for doing something wrong, or that they should be punished in a legal or social sense for doing something wrong. So we've seen a little bit about why this topic is important and why the idea that we don't have free will might be a threat to our conception of ourself and also our conception of how we organize society. Now to determine whether that threat is actually real, it's realized, well, we have to look at what are the arguments against free will. And the most important argument, the main argument against free will, is what I'm going to call the disjunctive argument against free will. And we're gonna look at this ar argument in the next two videos. So first I wanna begin by just looking at the structure of the argument. Um, and how it gets to its conclusion. So I'm calling it the, disjuncti the, the disjunctive argument against free will because in the first premise it presents us this disjunction or a, a sort of uh, uh, either or statement and it gives us two possibilities. P1 says either determinism or indeterminism is true. Now uh, soon we're going to explain what those terms mean, and in this video we'll largely be focused on determinism. But for the moment, just notice that there are these two options, determinism or indeterminism. P2 says that if determinism is true, then human persons don't have free will. P3 says if indeterminism is true, then human persons do not have free will. So the conclusion is human persons do not have free will. Right, the idea is that there are these two things that could be true, determinism or indeterminism, both of them lead to human beings not having free will, so therefore we don't have free will. Now of course there's much more to explain here, specifically the terms determinism and indeterminism, which the argument largely hangs on. And in order to wrap our minds around this, I want to sort of explore what it is that determinism and indeterminism are about before we give a definition of what they are. Determinism and indeterminism are both claims about the causal structure of the universe. We all accept that there are relationships of cause and effect in the universe. If you go back to our discussion of cosmological arguments, for instance, Aquinas thought that this idea of cause and effect was foundational, it was crucial to his argument for the existence of God. So we all accept that there are causes and there are effects of those causes. The question is, what is the relationship between cause and effect? And that's what determinism and indeterminism are about. Determinism says that that relationship is one way, and indeterminism says the relationship is another way. And philosophers debate among themselves whether determinism or indeterminism, indeterminism is true. In fact, even physicists jump in, into this fight as well. But for the purpose of this argument, notice that the claim is that no matter what we think about the relationship between cause and effect, no matter whether we think determinism is true or indeterminism is true, human beings do not have free will. So at this point, there should be a couple questions in your mind. First, what is determinism? Second, what is indeterminism? And third, why do both of these undermine our ability to have free will? Okay. So let's start to explore these questions. Now, as I just said, de determinism and, and indeterminism are both about the causal structure of the universe. So if you take the moment you're at right now, the moment where you're watching this lecture on your laptop or your phone or ho however you're watching it, and you ask yourself, well, how did I get to this moment right here? Well, you could list off a long string of causes that brought you to this moment. You might say, well, um, you know, before I started this lecture, I, I opened the door and sat down in my chair, um, and before that I had breakfast, and before that my alarm clock went off and caused me to get up, and, you know, before that I was brought into existence by my parents, who were brought into existence by their parents, who only existed 
um, in virtue of the source, social organization or country they were in, which was founded at this time. Right? I, I could keep going and going and going. There is a long string of causes behind you that, for the most part, we don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but that brought you to where you are at this exact moment. And so again, when we're talking about the causal structure of the universe, we're talking about whether determinism or indeterminism is true, we're asking, what is the relationship between those causes and their effects? When we say that the causes in the past brought about the present moment, and that what happens right now will be bringing about or causing what happens in the future, what do we mean by that notion of cause? So that's what we're interested in. What is the relationship? So now that we have seen what determinism and indeterminism are about in general, what question they're attempting to answer, we're now going to look in more detail at each of these doctrines. And in this video, we're going to look at the second premise of the argument. We're going to look at determinism and the relationship it has to free will. In our next video, we'll look at indeterminism and the relationship that that idea has to free will. And the first point I want to make is one that Cain makes in regard to how the problem of free will arises. Because I think if we start to think about why it is that human beings start to ask the question, why we have free will, we can see how the idea of determinism can ultimately undermine our sense of free will. So here's what Cain says. He says, The problem of free will arises in human history when, by reflections such as these, people are led to suspect that their actions might be determined or necessitated by factors unknown to them and beyond their control. This is why doctrines of determinism or necessity are so important in the history of debates about free will. Whenever determinist doctrines arise, their appearance signals that humans have reached a higher stage of self-consciousness in which they begin to wonder about the sources of their behavior and about their place as actors in the universe. So what we're going to see is that determinist doctrines, there are different kinds, but the idea is that a determinist doctrine will always hold that what happened in the past, some past event, makes it so that what you're going to do next had to occur. It's the idea that past events necessitate the future or necessitate the present, what you're doing right now. And if that's true, then that means that our actions are very much, as Cain um, points out, if all that is true, that means our actions are very much necessitated by a number of factors, a number of occurrences that we had no control over. We have no control over what happens in the past. We have no control over the long chain of causes that brought us to this moment. And so it's these sorts of reflections um, that give rise to determinist doctrines, which ultimately undermine free will. Now, another interesting point he makes is that these determinist doctrines, when they appear, it is only because human beings have reached a higher stage of self-consciousness. A stage of self-consciousness self in which we can wonder about, why do I act the way I act? And we should think about why this is the case. And I want you to ask yourself the this question right now. If you believe you have free will, why do you believe you have that ability? If you believe you have the ability to make choices and that your f ability to make those choices is free and depending on what choice you make, you could have done otherwise. If you think you're free and in control of your own life and your own acts, why do you feel that way? Now answers here may vary, but I think for many people, the reason is just that in the moment, we don't feel constrained. We don't feel controlled. For instance, right now I'm recording this lecture, but um, there, I have a real sense that if I wanted to, I could simply put down this microphone, turn off the computer, get up and leave the room. Now, am I going to do that? No, I've, I'm already, you know, a number of minutes in here. I don't want to waste this work, so I'm going to go ahead and complete the lecture. But if I wanted to, I can make the free choice to get up, leave, and do something else. And throughout our day-to-day -day lives, we constantly have this feeling, right? Unless someone's like literally has us um, in handcuffs or chains or has a gun to our head, we don't feel constrained. We feel like we're just making our own choices that we could do otherwise. The point Kane here is making, though, is that when you start to reach a higher stage of self-consciousness, then that sort of feeling can dissipate. 
Because this a higher stage of self-consciousness might be one where you say, well, wait a minute, am I totally responsible for this act? Or is the long history behind me, the genetic structure of my body, the way the psych my psychology is made up, the way my brain is composed, what effect is this having on my actions? When we just look at the world from a first-person subjective point of view, we feel free. When we take a step back and we think about the fact that we are biological entities subject to causation, that the more we figure out about the brain, the more we can correlate it with how people act and how they think and feel, and the more we take that sort of higher notion, that higher stage of self-consciousness, the more we think about the source of our, of our actions, the less free we can actually seem, the less free we can feel. Even if in our day-to-day -day lives, we feel like we could do otherwise. And Cain thinks this is when determinist doctrines arise. And he says, determinist doctrines which say that what you do is determined by some sort of past event can take many historical forms. He says some people, you know, a determinist doctrine could be what you do is determined by fate, maybe it's determined by God, maybe it's determined by the laws of physics, your genetic makeup, your heredity, your environment. Um, you know, many, uh, the most famous psychologists of the 20th century, um, Skinner and Freud, each gave a different sort of deterministic uh, explanation of human behavior. Freud saying it was a bunch of unconscious motives you're not aware of. Skinner saying it was a process of psychological or social conditioning where your parents and society and your teachers teach you to act a certain way and this is what determines your behavior. But the point is that for all these doctrines, to, for those doctrines to come about, it has to be the case that we stop looking at the world and our actions just from our own point of view, and we start to wonder, what caused me to act in this way? And I'm sure you've all had that sort of experience, where maybe you act in a way and you didn't expect, and you say, what caused me to do this? But you should really reflect on that, on that phrase, what caused me to do this, because what are you saying? If you're saying you were caused to do this action by something, is it something outside of yourself? Is it something outside of your control? And if it is, now you're putting, starting to understand and put forth a sort of deterministic view of the universe. Okay, so those are some general points about determinism, but we should be a little more clear in exactly what determinism is, a little more precise. So here's the way that Cain explains it. An event, such as a choice or action, is determined when there are conditions obtaining earlier, such as the decrees of fate, or the foreordaining acts of God, or antecedent causes plus the laws of nature, whose occurrence is, a suffi is sufficient for the occurrence of the event. In other words, it must be the case that if these earlier determining conditions obtain, then the determined event will occur. And determinism is simply the idea that every single event is determined by something prior. Now, what is that prior determining thing? Again, there can be many different deterministic um, doctrines. You might say fate determines what I do. You might say God uh, determines what I do. You might take a scientific point of view and say that everything I do is determined by some cause in the past. So there can be many different forms of determinism, but they all share in this idea that every event that occurs, everything that happens, is necessitated to happen by something that happened before it, something that happened in the past. Now, when I use the word determinism, again, there are many different kinds of determinism, but when I use the word determinism, I'm largely going to be talking about a specific kind of determinism, which is the most popular in this debate. One of the possible determiners I mentioned was prior physical causes. And it's this sort of determinism that comes out of reflections upon science. If we think about the great success that science has had in explaining and predicting the physical world, right? You know, why does the planets move the way they do? How the water cycle works, right? All these sorts of scientific explanations we give of the world. And we imagine that, well, to explain an event scientifically is just to say, well, here are the events that caused it, you know, the past events that brought this about. This is why these entities move in the way they do. And then you say, well, human beings are also part of the natural world. We have physical bodies, 
and they seem to be subject to causation. So they say, well, why can't we explain human beings and their behavior in the same way? And this sort of determinism we're going to call causal determinism. And the idea behind causal determinism is this. It's the thesis that all events, except for perhaps the first event, are determined by one prior events in conjunction with the laws of nature. So let's, so right now you're listening to this lecture. You reach a higher stage of consciousness where you start to say, well, why am I listening to this lecture? What caused me to do this? I could be doing any number of things. I could have gone on and read a book. I could be watching TV. Why am I listening to this lecture right now? A causal determinist will say, well, here's the explanation. First, the universe is set up with certain laws of nature, right? There's certain fundamental physical laws that govern how things, how physical entities in the universe work. So first, there's all these laws of nature. And second, there was a whole host of prior events, prior causes that brought you to, to this point. And given those laws of nature, and given everything that happened up to this point, going all the way back to the Big Bang or God or whatever you think accounts for the origin of the universe. Given those things, it had to happen that you were watching this lecture at this moment. All those prior causes plus the laws of nature determined you to be watching this lecture. According to causal determinism, we can explain your actions just in the same way we explain how anything works. You say, well, you know, why is that car going down the road at 50 miles an hour? Well, you say it's because the person driving the car is pushing the pedal to a certain degree, um, and I have no idea how cars work, but somehow that is uh, converted into making the, the engine propel the car at a certain speed, and that's all just a mechanical, physical system that works on causation. And so you'd say, well, here's a long chain of, uh, with the human being, here's a long chain of events that happened Here's the way your brain is set up. Here's the way your body is set up. Here's how you were raised. Here's the country you were born in. Here are all the experiences you had and all the things that happened to you. And those were all just causes. Those were inputs into the machine that is you that produced the output of you watching this lecture right now. That's causal determinism. So it's an interesting idea and it's an idea that really came into prominence with the advance of modern science because with the with the great success that modern science has had in explaining how things happen it was just natural to apply it to human beings and one famous illustration of this idea right taking this idea to its logical conclusion was given by the um the physician and mathematician uh uh pierre simon laplace a, a a French thinker who imagined, he said, well, if we imagine the universe as this vast machine working on causation where uh, prior events determine and necessitate what happens in the present and the future, then he says that means the complete predictability of the universe would be possible. Now, that doesn't mean that we can completely predict the universe. It doesn't mean that I can just look at you and say, oh, I know exactly what you're going to do tomorrow and next week and a year from now, right? Human beings, we don't have that sort of knowledge. But imagine a being that was omniscient. Imagine a being like God. Imagine some sort of super intelligent being who knew everything. And specifically, imagine a being, a super intelligent being who knew all the laws of nature and who knew every single event that occurred up to this point. Wouldn't that being be able to predict with exact precision what you will do in the next moment? This is at least what Laplace um, imagined. So he says, an intelligence knowing all the forces acting in nature at a given instant, as well as the momentary positions of all things in the universe, would be able to comprehend in one single formula the motions of the largest bodies as well as the lightest atoms in the world, provided that its intellect were sufficiently powerful to subject all data to analysis. To it, nothing would be uncertain, the future as well as the past will be present to its eyes. So his claim isn't necessarily that there is a being like this. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But he's just saying that if determinism is true, and everything that happens happens because of prior events and the laws of nature, then it would at least be conceivable or hypothetically possible to predict every single event that occurs in the universe. 
Now, we might ask, well, why does that matter? Okay, sure, I mean, if you knew everything, then yeah, you could predict the future. What difference does that make? It makes a difference because it means there has to be a certain relationship between cause and effect, and that has a very important valence or very important implications for free will. So just to recap, if determinism is true, then when we're talking about causes and effects or events and the causes that bring them about, the relationship is one of necessity. So given that cause one occurred, cause two had to occur, cause three had to occur, and then the event that we're talking about, that had to occur in the way it did. So determinism means a relationship of, of necessity between cause and effect. And of course, what does that mean for free will? Well, Cain explains this point, and this is the justification for P2 of the argument. To see where the conflict lies between determinism and free will, consider again what free will requires. We believe we have free will when we view ourselves as agents capable of influencing the world in various ways. Open alternatives or alternative possibilities seem to lie before us. We reason and deliberate among them and choose. We feel, one, it is up to us what we choose and how we act, and this means we could have chosen or acted otherwise. This up to usness also suggests that, two, the ultimate sources of our actions lie in us and not outside us and factors beyond our control. So to be free, what you do has to be up to you and has to be in your control and not within the control of things that are outside of you. And if free will implies these conditions, one can see why determinism would be a great threat to free will. If one or another form of determinism were true, it seems that it would not be up to us what we choose. And it seems that the sources and origins of our actions would not be in us, but in something else. Specifically, the reason why you're watching this lecture right now is the long chain of causes going all the way back to Big Bang, uh, to the Big Bang, or God, or whatever brought the universe about. And none of that was in your control. So it seems in a very real way that determinism doesn't leave any room for free choice. We simply act as, as in the way we are programmed, so to speak. And to further explain this point, I want to consider one of the examples that um, Cain discusses. So he imagines, suppose Molly has just graduated from law school and has a choice between joining a large law firm in Dallas or a smaller firm in Austin. If Molly believes her choice is a free choice made of her own free will, she must believe both options are open to her while she is deliberating. She could choose either one. And such a picture of an open future with forking paths, a garden of forking paths we might call it, is essential to our understanding of free will. Such a picture of different possible paths into the future is also essential, we might even say, to what it means to be a person and to live a human life. So th what he's getting at here is there are two ways you can think about the future. So one, you can think the future is open. And if you think the future is open, that means you think there are multiple things that could happen in the future and that you have some power to determine what, which of those futures come, comes about. So here's the way Cain represents it, right? What, you have the closed past, right? So whatever happened in the past is beyond your control, which, just as a side note, is actually a very good thing to keep in mind, given the amount of distress, worry, and anxiety we feel over the past. But everyone admits that whatever happened in the past, all the time, is never within your control. It's already happened. So then you are, here you are at the moment of choice, you're Molly deciding to, um, which law firm you, you want to work for. And depending on what choice you make here, um, we might say according to one conception of the future, there are many different paths that could result. There are many different alternatives that could come about. Dep now, when you make a choice, certain options are closed off, but other options open up. And according to this idea of an open future, there are you have the ability to do otherwise. Because if she had decided to go to the Dallas law firm instead of the Austin one, that would have brought up different alternatives, different options, and vice versa. So one way to think of the future is that it's open. Many p alternate paths, many possibilities are open to us, and we can choose which one of those come about. On the other hand, another way to think about the future is that the future is closed. So the future is closed for someone if and only if, one, 
there are non multiple ways in which the future could turn out or you lack the ability to control which of those futures comes um, which of those futures actually happens and if the future is closed we don't, we don't have a garden of forking paths what we have is just a single straight line you might say with a bunch of other imagined possibilities so if the future is closed here we have the closed past the past is always closed that's not up for discussion then you have the moment of choice you're making this decision between the law firm in dallas or austin but if the future is closed then it was always going to be the case that whatever happened um, was determined to happen by what happened in the past. If the future is closed, then if, for instance, Molly chooses to go to the Dallas law firm, that was the choice she had to make. Because given how she was raised, given all her other experiences, given everything else that happened in the past, that is what determined her to make the other choice she, she ma make the choice she made. But you might say, wait, wait a minute, Ryan. Um, you know, Molly can imagine doing something else. So let's say she goes to the Dallas law firm. Well, she could imagine going to the Austin law firm. She could even imagine um, not going to any law firm at all. She could say, I'm going to give up on a career in law. I'm going to go into a career in painting. And in fact, she can imagine many other possibilities besides those. So if the future is closed, then what do we say about those? Well, we say that they're merely possible outcomes. There are things that are merely possible, merely imaginary, but could never actually have come about given the past. Given the past, she had to choose to go to the Dallas law firm. The past determined, past events determined that that's what she would do. Now, she can imagine herself doing other things, but those possible other futures, those possible other alternatives, they're like unicorns. I can come up with a idea of a unicorn in my head, but I don't think it's real. I don't think it's actually possible. I don't think it's, it, it doesn't exist in the real world. And if the future is closed, then we have to say the exact same thing about all the alternatives that you imagine you could have enjoyed, all the alter alternative paths you think you could have taken. So we have two conceptions here, an open future or a closed future. And of course, if the future is open, then it seems like, yeah, we could have free will because we, we have the ability to, to do otherwise. Molly could have taken another path. But if the future is closed, then free will is an illusion. Molly can imagine herself going to the Austin law firm, but that was never really a possibility. She was determined to go to the Dallas law firm based on the past. So the open future seems to give us free will. A closed future seems to take away free will. So the only question is, well, if determinism is true, is the future open or closed? And of course, it seems clear that if, in fact, determinism is true, the future has to be closed. What you're going to do is determined to happen in an orderly fashion, just as any machine, its actions are determined to happen in an orderly fashion, given how it's programmed and given all the inputs. So if determinism is true, then the future is closed. And if the future is closed, then we can't have free will. And why can't we have free will? It's important to be specific about this. Notice, remember that free will requires two things. It requires rational deliberation. We have to be able to think about what we're going to do. It also requires the ability to, to do otherwise. Now, determinism doesn't actually undermine rational deliberation. Even if determinism is true, Molly will still undergo a process of thinking about what she's going to do. She'll think about, well, here's why I should go to the Austin law firm. No, here's why I should go to the Dallas one. Here's why I should drop out of law completely and become an artist on the beach. Right? She'll think about all those things. So determinism doesn't mean you don't think about what you do. Of course we do. It just means that the, the decision you make is completely determined by what has happened in the past, past events and the laws of nature. So determinism doesn't undermine rational deliberation, but it does undermine the ability to do otherwise. If the future is closed, then whatever we actually do is what we had to do, what we were necessitated to do, and that means we don't have the ability to do otherwise, and it means we don't have free will. This is why, according to the second premise of the argument, if determinism is true, human beings cannot have free will. But of course, you'll recall that 
There's a second option in the argument. It also mentions indeterminism. Could that possibly give us free will? Maybe. But to see that, we'll have to wait till the next video. So I will stop here. I hope this video was useful, helpful, and maybe a little entertaining. And I will see you next time.